Since September 2020, the Asian Development Bank has been working on a comprehensive review and update of our 2009 safeguard policy statement. Throughout this process, we have placed great emphasis on meaningful stakeholder engagement, ensuring that consultations and communications are inclusive, timely, comprehensive, and safe. So far, we have completed 18 analytical studies on the policy architecture and on various environmental and social issues. We held more than 130 consultations with more than 3,500 people. We engaged ADB's developing member countries, thematic experts, the private sector, civil society organizations, indigenous people, and the communities directly affected by ADB finance projects. Participation in the process has been tremendous, and the diverse experiences and lessons learned have helped shape the drafting of the new policy. We now call the new policy ADB's Environmental and Social Framework, or ESF, and I'm pleased to be launching the first draft for further consultation. The draft ESF contains an environmental and social policy, which sets out the overall policy objectives and a set of 10 environmental and social standards that will apply to ADB financed and administered sovereign and non-sovereign projects. The ESF supports ADB's vision of a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. It does this by setting requirements for protecting people and the environment, and by promoting and strengthening environmental and social systems, and the implementation capacity of ADB's developing member countries and clients. In the coming months, we will again reach out to you for a series of regional and in-country consultations on the draft policy and standards. This will be the last stretch of the policy review and update, with a new policy expected for approval by ADB's Board of Directors in 2024. Further information is available on our website. With your support, ADB continues to do good by doing better. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the information session on the consultation approach on the draft environmental and social framework of the ADB. My name is Jelson Garcia from the Stakeholder Engagement Team of ADB Safeguard Policy Review and Update. The focus of this session is to introduce the draft ESF that will be the focus of extensive consultations and provide an overview of the stakeholder uh, consultation approach and key activities in the next six months. So just to align our expectation, this is not a technical, consultation on the policy per se. As indicated in your invitation, this is an information session which we designed to be useful for government agencies that are coordinating with ADB as they prepare their agency-wide feedback on the uh, draft uh, policy. We also designed this session to guide civil society stakeholders as they are now preparing and coordinating with their network members for their in-depth substantive engagement in the consultations in the next six months, whose details we will share a little later. So at this juncture, I would like to call Mr. Bruce Dunn. He is the Director of Policy and Technical Services in the Office of ADB's Safeguards to give us a background on the draft environmental and social framework or ESF. Over to you, Bruce. Thanks very much, Jelson, and uh, great to be here with you all today. Uh, so as Jelson has mentioned for this session, we wanted to update you on uh, where we are now with the draft of the environmental and social framework, uh, but primarily introduce to you the next stage of the consultation program where we're seeking opportunities to get feedback on the draft. Uh, so in terms of this presentation, um, I'm gonna kick off initially just to give you an update on the progress that we've made and where we are now. And then my colleague Madhumita Gupta will go into further details about the consultation program before we open up to um, a wider you know, conversation to get your feedback. Uh, before I do go into the details, though, I really would like to sincerely thank everyone that's participated in the process so far. Uh, we've had an extensive process of consultations uh, to get feedback on the lessons learned, from the implementation of the existing policy 
and to look at the directions for the new policy. And uh, as we've traveled around the region and had many online consultations, we've really been fortunate to get your inputs and, and to learn from that process. So, you know, what you'll be seeing today is really kind of building on those consultations so far. Now, if we can go to the next slide, that's it. Uh, so ADB had an independent evaluation that was completed on our existing safeguard policy statement um, from 2009. And that, without going into the details now, essentially concluded that uh, ADB needed to update and modernize the policy and that we should seek opportunities to harmonize the policy uh, to support international good practice, but also um, to find opportunities to have our policy to be more closer to that of other multilateral development banks. Uh, at the same time, we do need to make sure that the new policy is adapted to uh, the regional needs. Um, we work across a very diverse region uh, from small island developing states to uh, challenging um, development contexts, maybe fragile and conflict affected situations, and countries right across the development spectrum. And we work in both public and private sector. We provide financing to our sovereign uh, government partners, and we also work uh, with private sector investment. And we increasingly have a very broad range of financing modalities. So we need a policy that is going to be you know, fit for purpose for what the region needs and also for those different types of modalities that ADB supports. We're also hearing from uh, many of our you know, member countries and also within ADB that while the process should support international good practice, um, you know, we need to make sure that we protect people in the environment. Uh, we also need to make sure that the process is efficient. You know, at the end of the day, we want to be able to develop and implement projects that deliver results, right? So, uh, you know, whether that is supporting uh, education or healthcare or uh, investing in climate change adaptation and resilience or a transition to low carbon, we want to be able to develop those projects and get the benefits from them, but in a way that ultimately you know, protects people and the environment and, and does that um, in a way that is very sensitive to the community needs. So we're seeking, you know, overall, when you see this slide, to, to find a balance, support international good practice, make sure it's aligned with the country and regional needs and deliver the results at the end of the day. If we move to the next slide, um, now in the introductory video from our um, Managing Director General, Wu Chong Um, he's provided a bit of a summary of what has been done so far. And I'll recap on some of that. Uh, we developed an approach or methodology for the process that started uh, in late 2020. Uh, we developed a background information paper that set out our proposed approach. Uh, we did consultations and then developed a stakeholder engagement plan. Uh, we then moved into the next stage of developing a whole series of analytical studies. And then over the last uh, you know, six to 12 months, we've been working on the policy preparation. And we've done a number of consultations around that as well uh, to share what we thought in terms of the policy directions, but then to get feedback uh, from civil society, from our developing member countries, from the private sector, as well as affected people, um, and get initial ideas that have helped to formulate the draft. Uh, we're now working though on um, the, the first draft and having further consultations around that before we seek to finalize it next year. And I'll go into more details on that in the forthcoming slides. Uh, if we move to the next one. Uh, you see here further information on the stakeholder engagement plan. And this was a very important aspect for us initially that um, we would develop the safeguard policy in a way that really had diverse participation and an inclusive process. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the process itself was, was open, was safe, and also iterative. That's why we've been going through various stages in the consultation process. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, you know, we build interest, but also ownership in the new safeguards. Um, that's very important uh, when ultimately it comes to implementing. And we have developed this in a, in a three-phase process. I've mentioned some of this already in the methodology, uh, we started with the initial outreach and stakeholder engagement plan. 
Then phase two was all about the studies and getting feedback on the studies. And now uh, that we've got a draft, we're moving into the stage of consultations on that first draft. If we go to the next slide. So a little bit more detail on what has been completed so far. Uh, so we've mentioned the analytical studies. There was 18 studies that we completed. These looked at a whole range of issues from uh, the policy architecture and benchmarking that against other multilateral development banks and financial institutions, as well as looking at a whole range of environmental and social issues, gender issues. All of those studies uh, were made uh, available publicly. And if you go to our uh, website, there's a dedicated page for the Safeguard Policy Update and the uh, QR code that is on the screen. Uh, that will take you to that page and you'll be able to access uh, those studies. Uh, for each of the studies, we did dedicated consultations, and we've also got the presentation materials, as well as summaries of those consultations and the feedback that we received. Uh, the stakeholder engagement process uh, has, has been very important to us. And, you know, so far we've had more than 130 consultation events. Uh, some of those during the COVID period were online, but once we were able to, we commenced a process to travel across the region. You'll see there's a, a box there on the screen showing uh, the countries that we visited. And in each of those countries, we held consultations, but also um, uh, brought together um, sessions with our developing member countries, uh, with key ministries, but also executing and implementing agencies that have worked with ADB, as well as uh, dedicated sessions with civil society. And in some cases, we held uh, special focus groups on various different topics. Uh, so, you know, fair, fairly comprehensive in terms of the stakeholder engagement uh, approach. Uh, we have been, though, learning from that process. And uh, we have actually produced a, a master consultation summary uh, which we're just uh, doing some final uh, editing, and I expect that to be up on our website in the next few days. If we go to the next slide, uh, here you'll see a bit more information on the, the current preparation schedule. So we released actually the, the first draft of the new environmental and social framework on ADB's website on the 7th of September. And that was also being sent out to stakeholders that have participated in earlier consultation programs. We're going to be discussing that with ADB's board uh, next week on the 27th of October. Uh, that will be an opportunity to hear from our board uh, in terms of their views on the draft. But after that, we're going to be launching uh, the next stage of the consultation program. And that'll be rolling out from uh, November through to March next year. And just like the previous process, we're going to be having uh, you know, a series of meetings uh, in uh, countries across the region. Plus, we'll also be doing online consultations uh, with governments and civil society on various different topics. That will then lead to uh, an updated draft, which we'll make available. Um, we will have two versions. One will be the update, but we'll also share a markup version in terms of what we're proposing to change from the draft uh, to uh, version two. Uh, plus, we'll also have uh, further summaries of the consultation materials. At this stage, we're then looking to go to our um, board uh, for a final discussion, what we call the R paper. Uh, that is anticipated by the end of the second quarter next year. So by the end of June next year. So, you know, we have this period from now up until June next year to refine the draft. And, and I think we're, you know, still very open um, and fairly humble to be able to, you know, get further views on the draft and then be able to integrate it. Once we then go to um, getting board approval, uh, the policy will not be effective though immediately. Uh, we are planning to have a 12-month period before the policy then becomes effective. So that would take us through to the new policy starting to be rolled out and implemented from, um, say, July 2025. So projects that would be coming to ADB at the concept stage from July 2025 would then have to apply the new policy. 
And in that period, that first year, we're going to be doing a lot of uh, capacity development, and that will continue. We're looking to have a three-year capacity building program to support the rollout. If I go then to the uh, next slide, I'd like to now uh, change and give you a bit further details on what the current draft looks like. Uh, for those of you that have already gone to our website, uh, you would have started to look at the draft and uh, it's a fairly comprehensive document. So let me just give you a few minutes to explain the architecture of it and some of the main contents. So what you see on this slide is uh, what we call the environmental and social framework. And that has a number of components. Uh, the first one at the top of the screen, you'll see vision. And that is where we set out how the safeguards will support ADB's long-term vision and mission. We have our strategy 2030 that sets out the priorities for ADB, including how ADB supports a lot of uh, global and regional goals. For example, the um, global sustainable development goals. Uh, also other global commitments and priorities such as on climate change. Uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change is a very important priority for ADB as it is uh, for countries across the region. So, you know, the vision essentially articulates how we will support those and it sets out aspirations for the new policy. If you then come down to the uh, second tier, you'll see on the left-hand box what's called the environmental and social policy or ENS policy for short. And this sets out the objectives and responsibilities for ADB. What are we required to do with the new safeguards? So that rolls out to a number of elements, for example, in terms of uh, providing clear information to our borrowers and clients on what the safeguards are and what the safeguard requirements are, uh, to screening projects and screening what the potential impacts and risks are, uh, then to working through a process of undertaking due diligence and uh, ultimately to supporting our clients to implement the policy and undertaking our own uh, capacity support as well as monitoring and supervision. The next uh, box you'll see there in the middle of the screen is the environmental and social standards. And this sets out what would be the objectives, the scope and the requirements for our borrowers and clients. And this is where you've heard mentioned already uh, 10 proposed standards. And, and I'll go into details on those in a moment. That is then complemented by what's called our prohibited investment activities list. Uh, this is already in the current safeguard policy and we have updated that. Uh, then moving down to the next tier, um, I mentioned earlier that ADB provides financing to um, public sector as well as private sector, and we have a range of different financing modalities. So we have developed uh, in the main policy, uh, high level principles for the financing modalities, but then also a separate annex, uh, which would set out further details, including some of the, um, the high level requirements, as well as some of the procedural elements for the various different modalities. So, for example, uh, when we work with emergency assistance or when we work with policy-based lending or results-based lending or some of the programmatic approaches like our multi-tranche financing facilities or financial intermediaries. So they those details are set out in that document. So the combination of the ENS policy, the environmental and social standards, the prohib prohibited investment list, and the uh, requirements for financing modalities set out the mandatory requirements. And then that is supported by, for ADB, uh, what's called our operations manual and staff instructions that sets out further details for us. And we will then accompany this with a whole range of uh, guidance materials. Each one of the standards will have its own guidance note plus supporting materials on uh, good practices. And we also plan through the uh, capacity building program to develop a whole range of uh, awareness raising materials, training materials, e-learning modules, um, and other, other you know, essential toolkits that will be helpful for our borrowers and clients when they're implementing the policy. So that is the framework. If I go then to the next slide, I'll very briefly explain 
in terms of the environmental and social standards. Uh, you see here uh, the proposed 10 standards. Uh, now, some people sometimes see this as being, you know, perhaps more complicated. We've got three areas in the current SPS. It covers environment, involuntary settlement, and Indigenous peoples. We've essentially uh, split that out into a number of topics to provide further clarity. So each one of these standards has an introduction, it has a set of objectives, it has a scope of application, and it also has the requirements. And it starts very much with standard one. Now, standard one covers the assessment and management of both social and environmental risks. We previously had this uh, more fragmented between environment and social safeguards areas. We're bringing it together under one standard because clearly environmental and social risks are linked. And we'd like to have a process that you know clearly has a broad based understanding. So that standard one sets an umbrella, if you like. Then all of the other standards basically cascade from that. And we've got standards that relate to uh, a range of environmental issues, such as pollution prevention, health and safety, biodiversity, cultural heritage and climate change. Uh, we've also got standards that relate to social issues such as labour and working conditions, land acquisition, Indigenous peoples. And then we also have a cross-cutting standard on stakeholder engagement, information disclosure and grievance redress mechanisms. So together, this provides an integrated framework, but it also splits out and provides more details on individual topics. Then if we go to the next slide, uh, this next slide just provides a little bit of a, a graphic representation on how the proposed new standards relates to the existing safeguard policy. Uh, I mentioned before that the current policy has three areas, environment, involuntary settlement and Indigenous peoples. And you can see on this graphic how those three areas relates to the proposed 10 new standards. So you'll see, for example, standard one uh, basically brings together elements of the three previous areas, environment, involuntary settlement and Indigenous peoples. The other standards basically draw from uh, either the environment or social safeguards. Uh, standard 10 um, obviously brings together uh, elements that were there already around meaningful consultation and sets uh, a more, I would say, uh, comprehensive approach on ensuring that we have good practice stakeholder engagement. Uh, we do have some elements, though, that are not completely new, but um, are being brought more clearly into the safeguards framework. Uh, standard two, for example, on labour and working conditions. This builds on ADB's um, earlier social protection strategy for 2001, which committed ADB to uh, supporting and implementing the ILO core labour standards. Uh, we also had uh, the SPS environment principles that looked at the occupational health and safety for workers and the prohibited investment list, which had prohibitions on forced labour and child labour. Uh, so standard two basically brings these together and integrates it into the safeguard framework. Uh, the other one to draw attention to is standard nine. Uh, we previously had uh, elements on uh, climate change in the environment standards, particularly around managing greenhouse gas emissions. But we're also integrating in this new framework elements around uh, climate risk screening and resilience, uh, which ADB had as part of our internal procedures, but were not previously part of the safeguards. And you know, clearly with um, our you know awareness and the global priority around addressing. Uh, climate change, it's been important that we bring that into the framework. Uh, so, you know, in conclusion, uh, the new policy very much builds off the existing policy. Uh, but what we have done is review and try and provide greater clarity and in some cases strengthen uh, the existing safeguards. Now, this brings uh, me to an end of uh, my uh, presentation. I think, oh, I may have one further slide, actually. Let me just go to the, the last one, I think. There we go. All right. So um, before I conclude, uh, let me then highlight what is uh, available in terms of the, the consultation materials. So firstly, 
uh, the draft of the environmental and social framework. Uh, I mentioned before this was disclosed on the 7th of September, and uh, that will be available actually for uh, consultation um, and written inputs through until January next year. So we're keeping that open for a very lengthy period. Uh, then secondly, we have the environmental and social requirements for the financing modalities and, and products that was disclosed on the website at the same time. Uh, so if you go there, uh, there's a there's a QR code. Uh, you can find all those materials available. Complementing that, uh, we also disclosed on the 6th of October what's called a working paper that will be presented and discussed with our board. And within that, you'll find further background on some of the summary of the consultations, plus uh, some of the rationale for why we're moving in certain directions. You know, why have we decided to strengthen certain areas of the safeguards? You'll find some of the details on that within the working paper. There are also a whole range of other materials that are forthcoming. Uh, we've produced a series of uh, brochures, uh, which we hope will be uh, fairly easy to understand uh, that, that sort of map out the contents of the environmental and social framework, as well as the standards. And we are translating those into various languages. Uh, we also have um, some PowerPoint presentations that provide a bit more um, kind of uh, visual representation of the policy. And we're currently working to complement that with uh, some explanatory videos. So there's a lot of materials that we're putting out there. We don't want to overload you, but we also want to make sure that, you know, things are clear and that you've got, uh, you know, sufficient opportunity to um, understand what we're proposing and then to consult on it. So with that, let me now hand over to my colleague, uh, Madhu, who's going to talk to you more about the upcoming consultations. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, good day and a very warm welcome again. And thank you for this ongoing engagement and your contributions uh, for the past uh, three years of this policy review and update process. In this uh, overview, I will try and walk you through the overall approach and the key activities uh, we are planning for what we call phase three, which will be the final phase of consultation for the safeguard policy review and update process. Um, this session is mostly to prepare our ADB stakeholders for the next round of extensive and in-depth consultations on the draft environmental and social framework. Next slide. The phase three consultation has two objectives. One, uh, the consultations will solicit and document your feedback on the draft TSF and further inform the policy paper, uh, which we called the R paper in short. Uh, second, uh, to ensure spaces for a stakeholder dialogue and participation and get feedback. Um, the consultation will run for six months from November this year until March 2024. And within this time frame, we will uh, seek feedback from governments, private sector clients, civil society organizations, indigenous peoples, and all other stakeholder groups. Um, by the end of phase three, a feedback summary of each consultation will be prepared and disclosed. Uh, this feedback will also be considered into the revision of the final policy paper. Um, based on our experience on phase two, uh, we are trying internally to discuss what would be the most efficient way to share the feedback, you know, uh, much earlier uh, than we were able to do this time. We are trying to improve as we go on and we also learn lessons in this process. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to also uh, restate our commitment to meaningful consultation, uh, which is at the core of the stakeholder engagement plan that we published in 2021. Uh, like Bruce mentioned that at the very beginning and start of the process, we designed a stakeholder engagement plan to understand how we will engage throughout this journey. And this process then helps build ownership and also consensus amongst the different stakeholders on the provisions that finally we would have in the policy paper. Uh, 
We want all these consultations uh, ensure active participation from various stakeholders uh, through a safe, open, and transparent process. And at every stage, uh, we, you know, from ADB, we are trying our best to communicate the process, content, and outputs with clarity to maximize understanding. As you have seen that we have put out a lot of materials on the web. Uh, I know the, uh, the language can be sometimes very dense because it's a policy paper, uh, but we are trying our best to actually uh, translate those, um, I would say rather uh, simplify uh, those materials so that you are able to understand it uh, easily. All types of feedback are welcome. Uh, they will not be used for purposes of retaliation, abuse, or any kind of discrimination. Next slide. Similar to phase two, uh, we plan to have different types of consultations. So we'll have regional level consultations with governments and CSOs. We will visit selected DM, uh, DMCs, developing member countries, our clients, to undertake uh, in-country consultation with their governments and the civil society organizations in that country, uh, focus group discussions with private sector clients, and also you know, discussions with the non-regional member countries, pure uh, multilateral financial institutions, and international organizations. So we plan to do all of this between in the next six months. Next slide, please. For the regional events, uh, we will organize consultations in ADB's four regional hubs in the Philippines for East and Southeast Asia, India for South Asia, Pakistan for Central West Asia, and Fiji for the Pacific countries. Uh, government participation will be by nomination. Uh, the regional consultation with governments will run for two days uh, and will be done in person. The, se the sessions will allocate adequate time uh, for government representatives to articulate the official comments or agency-wide feedback or position on the draft ESL. So we are really looking for a very uh, you know, constructive feedback and a very valuable feedback from the government counterparts in terms of uh, uh, you know, in their response to the provisions that are now in the draft environmental and social framework. Um, simultaneous interpretation support uh, will be provided and a feedback summary will be prepared and this will be done for all the sessions. Next slide. We will organize uh, seven uh, in-country consultations in seven selected developing member countries. Uh, these are uh, Cambodia, Philippines, Indonesia, Fiji, India, Pakistan, and People's Republic of China. The drought uh, environmental and social framework will be the focus for this in-depth discussions uh, of country level issues and the capacity development support uh, to implement the environmental and social framework. We will have separate sessions for government and the civil society organizations in that country. Uh, it will be an in-person uh, session for gov governments, uh, while we are also considering a hybrid format uh, uh, for the civil society organizations, because last time when we organized phase two, uh, we had a lot of participants also who joined online when we uh, organized the civil society um, you know, discussion. Government participation will be by nomination, while for the civil society organizations, it is open to all, all those who have joined the phase two consultations, who work in the field of safeguards, uh, who uh, have you know different uh, knowledge of the different themes, and any interested groups are welcome to join those sessions. Simultaneous interpretation and feedback summary uh, will be uh, provided for those sessions as well. Next slide. The design of the CSO focused uh, regional consultations is a work in progress. 
uh, we welcome your suggestions uh, that, uh, you know, how we organize these discussions in a more meaningful manner and the safest manner possible. Uh, here are some considerations. Uh, uh, you can also add uh, to that list during our discussion today. Uh, we are considering organizing this by regional cluster given the diversity of experience and the lessons learned because what we found that uh, there are groups of, uh, you know, civil society organizations who spe specialize in a particular field. So it might be worthwhile to actually sometimes uh, have discussions around a particular topic and how it relates to safeguards. Um, each regional consultation may be it, uh, one day or two half days uh, considering the scope and an online format uh, will be used. Uh, some uh, we all have also seen that some CSOs might not be interested in all the sessions and they might be interested in one or few standards, uh, while others might be keen in commenting across all the environmental and social framework components. Next slide. We are also planning to organize, as I said earlier, focus group discussions with private sector clients, uh, organized by the type of transactions that we have with them. Uh, we will also have consultations with members of the Indigenous Peoples Advisory Group, then meet the North American and European CSOs, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we actually uh, travel to those countries. Uh, during our rounds, but then also we will organize online events. ADB is also setting up meetings with the peer uh, MFIs, uh, the UN agencies and international organizations. As I mentioned that, uh, you know, additional discussions on specific topics could also be organized, you know, as and when requested or when we feel that there is a need to really build consensus on a particular topic and it makes sense to actually sit down around the table, bring the experts and come to some conclusion. So these are the main approach and key activities of consultations that we are preparing and will be rolling out in the next six months. Next slide. Over here in this slide, what you see is the preliminary schedule. It's a work in progress where some planned consultations still need firm dates. Uh, as you know, you know, organizing these regional consultations and where you are, uh, where you also invite the other uh, development member, you know, uh, officials. There are a lot of logistics uh, involved. There are a lot of, you know, paperwork that is uh, required. So, and also confirmation of the dates of the host country government, but at that point of time, they are available to host so many guests, as well as, you know, have time to have a meaningful discussion. So all of those discussions are ongoing. So these are the tentative dates. And so it will start with People's Republic of China, which is in November. Uh, then uh, we'll have, uh, uh, then we'll also have, uh, the regional consultation in Pakistan, followed by uh, Indonesia, uh, then in Philippines, Philippines, which will be the regional consultation, and the in-country consultation will be around uh, third week, uh, third quarter January next year, followed by India during the time uh, mid-February, and Fiji in March. And Cambodia, we have not been able to firm up a date. We are just trying to squeeze a lot of the consultations uh, in, in the schedule. And as you know, there's a lot of background preparation is also needed to organize this smoothly. Uh, let me proceed to the next la last slide. Uh, to sum up, uh, there are three ways to actively engage in the next consultation phase. One, the regional and in-country consultations, the focus group discussions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, two, you can submit comments via uh, the email address that is up on the slide, safeguardsupdate at the rate adb.org. Uh, finally, you can fill out the online form. Uh, this is on the ADB website and has been included in our email blast. 
that, that we sent you last month and also included in the invitation that you received uh, for, for this uh, meeting. The link is also put in the Zoom chat. We hope to receive more written comments in the coming months following our information session this week. Uh, one of the question that, you know, obviously comes to everyone's mind that you, know, you have been engaging with us uh, for this long time and what happens to the feedback that you send us. Uh, what we would like to tell you is that due to, you know, the high number of feedback that we get, you know, not only from uh, civil society organizations, from the governments, from internally within ADVR departments, uh, then from our board members. So it sometimes uh, it is not really possible to respond to each and every comment individually. But what we are trying to do is synthesize them, trying and you know go and see you know what are the topics that are coming up you know on and on, and what are the kinds of changes that you want. So we are trying to put them in the form of uh, summary feedback, you know, and also, uh, uh, you know, put in different views. For example, there's not always consens consensus in every topic. So if there is a difference of opinion, we are also trying to synthesize them and put there that, you know, these, these stakeholders are of this opinion and maybe someone else has a very different opinion on that topic. Yeah. So this is how we are trying to collate uh, the feedback and we are we are uh, we'll, we will share with you for all the uh, 1718 analytical studies that we did if you really go to the website link there are also uh, it has also been listed out the different um, feedback that has come to us there is a list what what was said, we have not mentioned any names or any organization, but at least the key topics uh, that was discussed and the views have been there as much as possible. We could not put it verbatim. We had to make some edits so it's easily understandable and readable by everyone. Other than that, uh, we will also uh, disclose, I think within this week, uh, the summary uh, uh, feedback report for phase two. And then you also have the W paper, the working paper, which is already posted on the website. You'll see that it has a section on stakeholder engagement. And over there, you will also see a more a, summer, a more abridged form of what we have in the uh, bigger summary report. So there is a lot of material, so you can uh, review and read whichever suits you. Uh, anyway, I'm almost to the end of my uh, presentation. So that's the overall consultation approach for the next stage for the discussion of the environmental and social framework. I hope that this session has been uh, helpful for you to prepare and engage in the next phase of the safeguard uh, review and update process. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, so it's been great. Um, to be able to share this information with you and to get uh, some feedback. Um, but we would welcome very much uh, your comments on the draft environmental and social framework. Uh, as mentioned, uh, through our website, there's actually um, a portal there where you can submit comments, uh, or you can also find our email address to be able to uh, send written comments, uh, either individually or from your organization. And then I hope uh, the proposals that we've shared today around uh, the next steps with organising uh, regional consultations as well as some selected country consultations. Uh, plus, we will also share further information uh, in the coming weeks around uh, additional opportunities for online uh, and civil society consultations. So um, we really look forward to having, uh, you know, an open and inclusive process with you getting your feedback and making this a, uh, you know, much better uh, safeguard policy for the future and, and our collaboration with all of you. So look, um, really look forward to seeing many of you in the upcoming consultations. Uh, so with that, look, um, thank you again for joining. And uh, until next time, please take care. Thank you.